Thank you. I am grateful to the organizers for taking an interest in this work and inviting me to speak about it. And I realized this morning that I might need to apologize for the title because I'm not trying to say something about the relation between unitarity in Minkowski space and reflection positivity in Euclidean space. I'm going to assume that. Um, instead, this talk will be about the fact that we use correlation functions that have real OPE coefficients in the numerical bootstrap. And unitarity of the theory is sufficient to guarantee that, but it's not always necessary. And most of the talk will be based on this paper in 2017. And there will be a later paper which improves upon these results, uh, but I do not yet know when. Now, this is something that has implications in all dimensions, but I will focus on two dimensions. That's where we can say the most about it. Um, and making frequent reference to this plot, this exclusion plot, which should be fairly familiar by now. So this is a bound on how high the gap for scalars can be in two dimensions as a function of the dimension of the external scalar. And of course, every conformal field theory that we understand dimensions, um, right, every theory we understand well in two dimensions needs to live inside the blue allowed region. And there are many things we can do, but one thing we can do is consider the Virasoro minimal models where the scaling where the scaling dimensions are given by the Katz formula for integer values of m greater than two. So making various choices for m, choices for m and various choices for what operator we consider to be sigma, we can plot a whole bunch of points like this. Actually, one other thing we can do is take tensor products of minimal models. And this tells us that every point marked in this plot is actually the leftmost point in a line of allowed theories that runs horizontally. But all of these points, all of them are honest unitary conformal field theories. So that means they have a Hilbert space interpretation, and it means that their symmetries are Right, it means the symmetries are generated by currents. Uh, in other words, they're local. Both of these assumptions can be relaxed. So we know about one family of theories we've heard about in this workshop that are non-local and they're exactly solvable, uh, generalized free field theories. Uh, the correlators are all solvable by Wick's theorem. So these need to lie inside the allowed region as well. And more generally, they provide a way to get operators that are arbitrarily close to marginality. So for any two dimensional CFT having some relevant operator, we can couple it to a generalized tree field theory and flow it to the infrared. And this was a viewpoint advocated in our paper with Leonardo Rastelli, Slava Rijkaard, and Bernardo Zan, uh, some of whom are in the audience. So that's a fact of life. When you consider the numerical bootstrap, if you're not doing, uh, if you're not working with a system that contains external, sorry, if, if you're not working with a system that contains external stress tensors, then non-local CFTs will be allowed by your bounds, whether you're looking for them or not. And the same is actually true for non-unitary CFTs. And the reason for this is that we always work with a restricted set of correlation functions. And it could well be the case that the smoking gun for non-unitarity, namely uh, an imaginary OPE coefficient requires other correlation functions before you see it. So thinking about the upper bound on this plot where we have uh, a bunch of minimal models accumulating um, at the right, we can take the sigma operator to be to have cats indices of one and two and take the epsilon operator to have cats indices of one and three and then allow m to be an arbitrary real number so that 
we find this line having a slope of eight thirds. Now, depending on how you were introduced to minimal models, this might seem like a very formal thing, but it's completely well defined. So for real values of M, we can build a Verma module. We start with the primary having that dimension uh, and then consider virus dependence. And this Verma module is going to have null states. The special thing about integer values of M is that it has two null states. When we continue M, it only has one, but one is enough to do many nice things still. So it's enough to prove the fusion rule and it's enough to solve for correlation functions um, by solving differential equations. So this is a setup called the generalized minimal model. Um, it, it was considered at least as early as 2005, but there's a very nice review by Sylvain discussing, um, discussing 2D CFT in general with a section on generalized minimal models. And once we know how to compute their correlation functions, we can in particular expand those correlation functions into global conformal blocks and check when do we get positive OPE coefficients. And in this paper by Leandro Rastelli and Van Ries, they show that precisely in this case where M is a real number between three and infinity, the four sigma correlator does have positive OPE coefficients. Now I want to go through a bit of history of things people have done to improve on this plot. So this plot, I believe, appears in the first numerical bootstrap paper, the um, Ratazzi, Richkov, Tony, and Vicky in 2008. Um, and a few years later, there was a talk by Slava, which showed that the kink can be considerably sharpened from below if we insist that the first relevant operator is strongly irrelevant. So we can make it start at dimension three instead of two. A few years after that, Koss Poland and Simmons Duffin considered a system of three correlation functions in three dimensions in order to get an island around the icing model. And after this paper came out, several people, including me, were hopeful that similar techniques could be used to constrain minimal models in two dimensions. Uh, in particular, if you were interested in studying the icing model, you'd be able to impose what appears to be a very strong constraint, which is that epsilon does not appear in its own OPE, um, understood to be a consequence of Kramer's Vanier duality. However, this is not enough to get an island around the IC model in two dimensions. That was first done, or it was first published in 2019 by Anton de la Fuente. And in order to get the, the leftmost island in this plot, the, the red one, he had to assume that the spin two operators start above dimension three. So there's a gap above the stress tensor of with a size of one. So for whatever reason, this upper bound having slope of eight thirds, it doesn't immediately change when you use three correlators to constrain the number of even and odd relevant operators. And I've never heard a fully analytic explanation for this fact, but I wanted to sketch an explanation which is half analytic and half numerical. So if we go back to the generalized minimal models, we can find that for M between three and four, there are negative OPE coefficients. So in between icing and tricritical icing, this might suggest that some improvement should be possible. However, these negative OPE coefficients show up, they don't show up in random places, they show up in a super selection sector um, in this CATS operator one comma five. And the key is that this couples to epsilon cross epsilon, but it doesn't couple to sigma cross sigma. So it seems like a thing that's very special to two dimensions. And therefore we can ask the numerical bootstrap at the level of a single correlator is it possible to replace one comma five with other operators? So we can go to this single correlator crossing equation. We have, um, yeah, on the left-hand side, it's the usual thing. We have a sum of conformal block differences, which we've approximated as a finite dimensional vector. And on the right-hand side, we have a target. 
And this target is usually introduced as being the unit operator. But here, the target should be all of the operators we know about in the generalized minimal model, namely in the 1, 1 block and the 1, 3 Virasoro block. And we can sum this up with known coefficients and ask the numerical bootstrap, are there crossing symmetric solutions to this equation? And it turns out that there are. Actually, Connor, I, I'm a bit confused. I don't, I'm not sure I understand this sentence, what it means, finding operators to replace 515. What does it mean to replace 515? I didn't understand that. So I missed the point. It means if we assume that, um, that the theory living on the upper bound between m equals three and m equals four has all of the quasi primaries in the one one and the one three Virasoro block, all we need to do is is solve a crossing equation where these operators are already there, and then we allow for possible new operators. But why do you need to replace anything? Why can't you just take 515? Yeah, that's something interesting. Because th this would contradict the positivity assumption. If we had mm. this correlation function, th this four epsilon correlator in the minimal model, it would have, it, it, it wouldn't have squared real numbers multiplying each conformal block. So you are saying the correlation function that Anton de la Fuente uh, was dealing with when he produced his plots, it could not be generalized minimal model, it had to be something else. Exactly. Okay, and you are trying to see what this something else could be. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So when you use the numerical bootstrap in this single correlator problem, you could use the extremal functional method and see what the operators what the operators are that it finds. I'm okay. calling these operators that replace one comma five. So that means that these generalized minimal models, they don't fully explain what happens to the bound when we, when we look at a system of multiple correlators. Um, however, I wanna go back to this plot and I want to talk about how we actually find these coefficients. So I've made some quick claims that um, an early paper by Leando, Rastelli, and Van Rees computed generalized minimal model OPE coefficients in the four sigma correlator. And I made another claim that I know how to compute these coefficients of generalized minimal models in the four epsilon correlator. So I want to talk about how this is done a little bit. And the reason, so th this clearly has, it, it can lead to some intuition about the shape that these bounds need to take, but I haven't seen very many calculations like this in the literature at all. And part of the reason for that might be that the obvious approach you would take to compute them is very boring. So I wanna talk about some, some methods that not only make the calculation of these coefficients more efficient, but also more fun because they make contact with some other modern techniques in the study of CFTs. So are, are there any questions about the plan so far? Okay, and I'm actually going to talk about a slightly different plot. So this is the one that bounds the gap for scalars. But if you assume that there's a single uh, Z2 even relevant scalar, so that there's just epsilon and then all the other Z2 even scalars start above dimension two, then you get something that has an upper bound as well as a lower bound. And what's interesting is that there's a non-unitary solution which saturates this lower bound. And it was found appearing in the non-unitary bootstrap before people noticed that it also plays a role in the unitary one. So this is the paper that Marco mentioned, which reformulated the Guiazzi method in terms of singular values instead of determinants. And it'll be good to start discussing this because it's a warm up. It's, it's a little bit easier to deal with than the coefficients on the upper bound in generalized minimal models. 
So I want to tell you what the solution on the lower bound with a slope of four thirds is. And the short answer is that it's just a power of Z times a power of one minus Z, uh, the four sigma correlator. And, and it factors into a holomorphic and an anti-holomorphic part, surprisingly. So this turns out to be remarkably a single virasoral block. And it's the only virasoral block I know of, which is crossing symmetric by itself. And we can understand this a little bit better using the Coulomb gas formalism. So it's well known that a free boson has a central charge of one, but you can make the central charge strictly less than one if you introduce a background charge at infinity, which is conventionally denoted by two alpha naught. And this amounts to adding a total derivative term to the stress energy tensor. And what this does is it affies the formula for dimension so that a vertex operator with charge alpha no longer has dimension alpha squared, but it has this dimension of alpha times alpha minus two alpha naught. And with this formula, what generically happens when you try to make correlation functions that satisfy the neutrality condition is that you need to add screening charges, which are cooked up so that you integrate vertex operators, which turn into total derivatives when you act with Virasoro generators. So they don't modify the Virasoro ward identities. However, the easiest thing to do is just to write down four vertex operators, which all have charge alpha naught over two, so that the neutrality condition is manifestly satisfied without any screening charges. So you don't get a correlation function, which is some messy expression with iterated contour integrals. You just get a power law correlation function, and that's the one above. So this is a highly non-unitary solution because the identity operator is not exchanged. It's only this Virasoro primary with a dimension of four thirds sigma, which is exchanged. But we should ask, is this one of the non-unitary theories like the generalized minimal models where the non-unitarity is in a sense hidden from us? Does it still have a positive conformal block expansion when we, when we restrict to just this correlate? And there are three ways of showing that the answer is yes, or three ways that I know of. So the first is what I'm gonna call brute force. We can write down a Taylor expansion for this power law, just using the binomial theorem. Uh, solve for the Taylor coefficients in closed form. And then this also has to be equal to some expansion in SL2 conformal blocks. And then by demanding that the right powers of Z show up in both sides, we can recursively fix these coefficients CN. Another thing you can do is to use the Lorentzian inversion formula. So this, this correlator, even though it's non-unitary, it's bounded in the Regge limit. So you can compute its double discontinuity. And from that, um, solve for the spectral density. And since we do that in two dimensions, the residues will be two dimensional OPE coefficients, which means there'll be a product of a left moving CN and a right moving CN. And I should stress that this is a very mundane application of Simone's formula compared to what Johan talked about yesterday. Because in this case, we actually know the full correlation function to start. We're not doing some procedure where we get control of the double discontinuity first and then use that to learn about another part of the theory that we were not controlling. But because we're starting from a known correlation function, we could also use other inversion formulas, um, which go by the name of, of Euclidean inversion formulas. And one which I would place in this category is the so-called alpha space transform found by Hagerforst and Van Ries, where we can do this separately for the Z dependence and the Z bar dependence. So we solve for CN by looking at a spectral density, which comes from integrating the correlator 
integrating the left or the right moving part of the correlator against a certain 2F1 kernel, which is an eigenfunction of the one dimensional conformal Casimir, except, uh, except one that's normalizable. So it's not a conformal block, it's a linear combination of a conformal block and its data. Connor, can I ask uh, something? Yeah. It, can, can this correlator also be interpreted as like a generalized free theory, but the four point function of a phi cubed type of operator? In which there is no identity and the exchange is like a five to the four operator, so it has like four thirds of the dimensions. Sorry, why is there no identity if you have a generalized free theory with phi cube? I mean, I think if you draw the diagram and you cut it, it's clear that you, you, the first operator that you get is phi to the four. Uh, but uh, okay, I might be too naive. I, I no, think composite operators in, in generalized free theory always have a non zero two point function. So self OPEs exchange the identity. I think I Connor, I and not turning up. I, I think it is a single with a single. I'd like to think of this as, as a written diagram. Um, but yeah, it's really just a generalized free field theory picture that you can also um, have. But then I think this particular correlator is like a single. Let me call it written diagram anyway, where the external operator is indeed the triple trace. And then the particular graph you draw is the completely connected graph for, um, for these four vertices that are each trivalent. So it's like you pick a, a square for the outer ones and then you draw a cross. And I think it's this written di this this diagram. That Thanks, Walter. That's what I meant. Sorry. Okay, I think I understand now. So, so this would be some some four point function which has a one over n expansion, and the identity is exchanged at O of one, but something like this would be exchanged at O of one over n. Exactly. Yeah. So crossing has to hold at each order, and right. there are there's a certain order where the identity appears, and another order where it doesn't. Correct. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Very good. Yeah, I, I think that's a perfectly good interpretation of the solution. I think it allows you to generalize this solution a little bit because you can change um, the masses uh, a little bit. If you think about you, this operator being a triple trace, you can make you can maintain crossing symmetry and say it's a, it's it's not the product of three times the same operator, but it's a product of two times the same operator and one lighter or heavier operator and then um, you can you can generalize the solution a little bit and since you can still draw the same diagram and you can show that uh, or there's a diagram that you can draw that's completely crossing symmetric i think you can you can uh, generalize things a little bit okay that's interesting yeah something worth thinking about yeah so there are three possible strategies to take there's the brute force method, which will find finitely many CN. You can find as many as you want, but you will always have to stop somewhere. Uh, there's Lorentzian inversion, which will give you general, it'll give you a general formula, but for a product. And then Euclidean inversion, where you can find a general formula for a single coefficient CN. And this formula turns out to be a 3F2. Do you have a question? Okay, so the question, if I'm paraphrasing correctly, is that this coefficient 
is dictated by the structure of a Vera Soro conformal block. So in effect, there's another brute force approach. You could solve for this conformal block, not by just immediately saying it's some power law, but by, by looking level by level and finding a basis for the kernel of the L1 operator at each level to get quasi primaries and then uh, proceeding to solve for these coefficients. And I think that's completely correct. So, so maybe there should be a fourth method. Um, but, but why do you want to find these coefficients? So I think I, that they are positive. Yeah. But we know in, in any CFT, we know classification of all positive uh, uh, norm states in terms of scaling dimension and center of charge. So you can just look up in, in the yellow book if this two thirds delta sigma and with the center of charge that you have is a, is a unitary representation or not. It's, it's not a unitary classified by cuts. So that means any theory built upon these Verma modules will, will generate negative um yeah it'll generate negative norm states when you take fusion no well i don't know i mean there's a first question is this representation two-thirds delta sigma is this a unitary representation that's the first question i think and, and the second question whether the whole theory is unitary of course the whole theory is not but this representation might be and to answer this question we don't need to do any computation you just have to open the yellow book I, I I don't agree because what else? Um, yeah, yeah, you, you could have said the same thing for generalized minimal models. No, because there there are several things, there are several blocks which conspire, and so you can have that one block contains negative coefficients, other block contains positive coefficients, and they kind of in the sum all the coefficients once you expand uh, the, the terms are positive but here we just have one block uh so ah no but there are also some you are saying that some coefficients can conglomerate on a different level yeah sorry i take it back no it's uh it's more subtle than what i said okay because because there could be some states which are negative norm but they are have there are other states with the same spin which have positive norm and things add up sorry take it back okay yeah we're about to see that the coefficients do turn out to be positive but is the representation unitary or not unitary this representation it it's a central charge that's, that's less than one and it's not a minimal model so it, it must be non-unitary no, not true, because if center of charge is less than one, then there are some representations which are non-unity, but maybe this one is. A, a discrete set, but this exists for arbitrary central charge. Less yeah, but with a dimension which depends on the center of charge. So I'm, I'm, uh... yeah, so I, and I, okay. Anyway, we will check it later. Thanks, Connor. Let's, let's okay. go ahead. So the, the, there's a variety of methods for solving for these coefficients CN, um, these, these coefficients of SL2 blocks. And now I wanna talk about whether or not they're positive and how to find this out. So a, a general formula that, uh, that, that's proven in this paper by Hagerforst and Van Ries is an SL2 block decomposition of this power law Z to the P over one minus Z to the Q. Um, what we're looking at is a special case of this formula. And the SL2 block coefficients in this expansion, they turn out to be three F2s. And there are two ways of assessing their positivity. We can recognize that they're actually very special three F2 functions. Uh, we can look at something called the ASCII scheme and recognize that these are examples of continuous Han polynomials. And polynomials in the ASCII scheme, they satisfy three term recursion relation. And by Bose's symmetry, the three term, the coefficients in this three term recursion relation turn out to be very special for us. One of them is actually zero. So they effectively satisfy a two term recursion relation. And therefore coefficient n plus one is just some multiple of coefficient n and it's a positive multiple. 
So that just immediately proves that if the first one's positive, then all the other ones are positive too. Another thing we can do is we can look at this 3F2 hypergeometric function. And if we talk about the ASCII scheme, we could look up a different theorem, which is called Watson's theorem, which is one of the three classical summation theorems for 3F2s. Uh, the others are Whipple and Dixon. And, and they're related by some invariance group of the differential equation that 3F2 functions satisfy. But anyway, we get to see that this 3F2 is nothing but um, an expression in terms of eight gamma functions. And again, it's manifestly positive. So we have various methods to solve for the CN. And then at least two methods uh, of proving that they're all positive. And when I talk about generalized minimal models, which is what I'll talk about next, we're actually going to need both of these tricks. We're going to need to use Watson's theorem and also look at the ASCII scheme. So are there any questions before I move on to generalized minimal models? Okay. So I said before that to charge less than one, four point functions can be expressed if you want as a bunch of iterated pure integrals uh, using the Coulomb gas formalism, but they can also be solved using null state equations. So these Vera Sorrel primaries in generalized minimal models, they have null descendants. So if the cuts in this use are R and S, have a null descendant at order R S. And this leads to a differential equation using the Vera Sorrel work that also has order R S. And the indices of this, of the solutions to this, of the R S linearly independent solutions are completely known from the fusion rules. So you can assume that there's some solution having asymptotic behavior z to the h, and then write corrections as a power series in z. And each solution like this, which you can solve with the Frobenius method, you iteratively solve for the Taylor coefficient b. Um, each solution that you find this way is a Vera Sorrel conformal block. And then you pair up the Vera Sorrel blocks um, in some modular invariant way, the simplest of which is the diagonal way. So this is, is a way to solve for arbitrary four point functions in a generalized minimal model, at least to some high order. You write down a null state differential equation and then use the Frobenius method. But in the four sigma correlator, the Katz indices are one and two. So this is a second order differential equation and we should be able to do something nicer. In particular, we should be able to get solutions that use 2F1 hypergeometric functions. So we can find these hypergeometric functions. One is for the Vera Soro identity block. The other is for the epsilon block. And then we can, we can expand these hypergeometric functions as an infinite series and apply a Euclidean inversion formula to each term in the infinite series. And then CN will be a sum of order n 3F2 hypergeometric functions. And proceeding this way, we get a very hard sum. And I have no idea how to perform it. But there's a trick. We can notice that in these Virasoro blocks, one of the upper parameters is half of the lower parameter. So we can apply a quadratic transformation, um, a standard identity for two F1s. And then we actually end up in a much nicer situation. So a CN is still a finite sum of three F2 functions, but now it's a finite sum of different three F2 functions. And they're actually much nicer. They allow us to use Watson's theorem, and then we can perform the sum. And what we end up with is that C2n in the identity block is a 4F3. C2n in the epsilon block is another 4F3. And at this point, I need to mention that after I found this result, I learned that it was also found um, in some unpublished work by Misha Isachenkov and Volker Shomeris. 
But these four F3 functions, again, are very special. Uh, they're what's known as Wilson polynomials. So another set of orthogonal polynomials in the ASCII scheme. And therefore, they also obey a three-term recursion relation. And without going into details about this, we can use the three-term recursion relation to, again, prove that these coefficients are all positive rigorously. Everything to the right of icing, so above one half. Oh, right. The question was, for which values of the central charge are these coefficients positive? And the answer is one half and above. Or, or may, maybe between one half and one. So the first minimal model, the second minimal model, and every, yeah, the first minimal model, the last minimal model, and everything in between. So things were very nice in this situation because the four sigma correlator obeyed a second order differential equation. But as soon as we move on to the four epsilon correlator, there the cat's indices are one comma three. Um, yeah, with one comma three, the differential equation is going to be third order. In that case, we have to just use the Frobenius method. Yes. So the question is, why use differential equations instead of Zemologikov's recursion relation? And this might just be a choice. I settled on, on a method I was comfortable with. It's similar to Raul's question about solving for these coefficients using the, the structure of the Virasoro block. There is an exchange about the recursion relation having poles, but the residues are zero, um, so that so we're still allowed to use it. Yes. So indeed, that, that might be that might be a good way to proceed to try to get similar results um, and, and put the higher correlators on on the same footing. But this, the state of this calculation where I, I left it in, in this old paper was that I proved positivity for the SL2 coefficients in the four sigma correlator. And then for the four epsilon correlator, I just computed a bunch of Taylor coefficients with the Frobenius method, and then computed a bunch of SL2 coefficients using brute force. And there are plots of them here. And we see again that they're all positive just empirically. So this is somewhat unsatisfying. And that's why I, um, I started working on this problem again, and that's what the end of my talk is going to be about. You might say that the brute force method um, being used on the four epsilon correlator should not be fatal because it's based on recursion relations. We recursively calculate the CN. And in the four sigma correlator, what we ended up with at the end of the day was actually just a recursion relation as well. I had this fancy expression in terms of a Wilson polynomial, but then after finding that, I went back to the recursion relation that Wilson polynomials satisfy in order to prove positivity. So if everything's just a recursion relation, we, um, yeah, why can't we prove positivity for the coefficients in the four epsilon correlator? And one answer to that is that this method it uses too many recursion relations. We solve for the BN recursively, and then we feed that into another algorithm to generate the CN recursively. And if we could get things down to just one recursion relation, then 
the four sigma correlator and all the other correlators would be on the same footing. So one way to do that is to, is to have a Frobenius method, which, which works naturally with SL2 blocks. So we don't want to look for a power series and then massage it to something else. We want to plug a control block expansion into a differential equation and get a recursion relation that operates directly on, on the coefficients of those conformal blocks. So is, is it clear why that would be desirable? Essentially, the nice thing about powers of Z is that you take a derivative and you still have a power of Z. So this, um, yeah, this set of functions closes under the operations we need. Uh, the set of conformal blocks does not close. Um, but if we move to a more general set of functions, uh, we can make them close. So I skipped over a slide here. Um, what, one thing I want to do is, is generalize the methods on this slide. Um, another thing I want to do is move on to extended chiral algebras. So in addition to, um, to the basic exclusion plot in the 2D bootstrap, which applies to all um, unitary two-dimensional CFTs, there's also a very nice plot in a paper by Rong and Su, uh, also from 2017, where they imposed S3 symmetry um, in two dimensions. And in this case, uh, it yields a very similar shape um, where there appears to be a kink. And then there's a bound which is saturated by the minimal models of the W3 algebra. And with these minimal models, you can play a similar game. You can analytically continue M to non-integer values and ask, do these non-unitary CFTs in between still admit conformal block expansions, which are positive, if you restrict to just this correlation function. So in this case, the W3 minimal models um, for the simplest correlation function, they happen to satisfy second order differential equations as well. So we can get ex explicit results like these Wilson polynomials, but I haven't done that yet. I wanted to use this as a testing ground for a refined Frobenius method. So I just want to talk about what this refined Frobenius method is on the last slide. So I said we need a set of functions that will close after we take derivatives. And conformal blocks will not give this to us. But there's a more general family of functions, FPQ, um, which will give this to us. Because if we take the derivative of FPQ, all we have to do is shift either P uh, by one. And there's this fraction one over one minus Z that shows up, but this is not a problem because if a differential operator kills a function, then one minus Z to any power times that differential operator will still kill the function. So once we plug in terms like this, it better be the case that FPQ can be re-expanded into finitely many conformal blocks. And there was some evidence in the literature that this would be the case. So there are papers by Dolan and Osborne, which expand certain functions that have this form uh, when they study super conformal blocks. And the motivation for that is that there are two presentations of the super conformal block, which are very useful. One of them makes the multiplet structure manifest the other makes the superconformal word identity manifest. Uh, so this was an encouraging hint. And another encouraging hint comes from the light cone bootstrap. If you look for patterns in how various operators contribute when you solve crossing in the light cone limit, you start to see evidence of this as well, because this FPQ function is part of the light cone expansion of a higher dimensional conformal block. So we know that in the leading asymptotics, 
conformal blocks in arbitrary dimension, uh, they turn into SL2 blocks. And then if we look at the higher order terms in this series, we start to see functions like FPQ. So I propose to use an ansatz uh, to solve a differential equation, which consists of which consists of conformal blocks. And then the action of the differential operator will produce copies of FPQ. And then we re-expand them into finitely many conformal blocks. So this is a direct Frobenius method that will allow us to extend the positivity proofs to higher correlators. One possible objection is that the CN that you get this way, they aren't going to necessarily obey three term recursion relations anymore, which, um, which turn out to be important for how you prove positivity of Wilson polynomials and things like this. Um, they might obey recursion relations with four or five or six terms, for example. But for this, it's sometimes possible to reduce the recursion relation from four terms to three terms. If a set of coefficients satisfies a four term recursion, it's almost never going to satisfy uh, a three term recursion, but we don't need this to be exactly satisfied. We don't need to still have an equal sign. We are allowed to use inequalities if we're just allowed to, uh, if we're just trying to prove positivity. So I think the way forward is by combining these two um yeah these two approaches and that that should allow us to improve our intuition about about exclusion plots in the numerical bootstrap at least in two dimensions um by looking not just at the virasaro algebra but other extended chiral algebras and i think that would be quite interesting um so i i don't have any more slides after this but this is a discussion so I don't need to conclude. I think uh, this is a good time to just open things up uh, for more discussion. So uh, thank you very much. Um, okay, I, I, I see two hands, but I don't know who was first, Kai and Alexander. Oh, oh, right. We're having trouble hearing. Yes. <laughs> but nice talk. Can you, um, if that was a question, um, I didn't hear it, so. Could you say it again? Maybe you could take the other question in the meanwhile. What's the other question? Yeah, when I said there were two questions, I was wrong. Um, I was mistaking the... Yeah. Yeah, the, the clapping emoticon from the question mark. Maybe the person who was asking the question can type it into the chat while I'm asking a, a question. Because the connection was not very good. Connor, so, uh, so I understand that uh, you, the thing that you are after, uh, basically in this talk, sorry that I'm trying to summarize for myself, is that uh, sort of there are some plots and it's interesting you know to understand why we have these bounds and not other bounds and your way to approach this is to try to find some explicit things that are sitting in the bounds under the bounds and they are 
preventing us from shrinking those bounds further and things like that, right? Yeah. But uh, there is a different question that uh, maybe is more urgent is that rather than reverse engineering, in engineering some weird theories which have these nice properties that they sit under the bounds, uh, like, okay, so people have, uh, you know, are pushing around some physically interesting theories. And uh, it would be interesting to know if somehow magically some of these physically interesting theories, which we think are not amenable because they're non-unitary, but actually they are amenable because of this phenomena that you are describing here or because of some other tricks. Do you have anything, uh, any comment to make about that? Um, well, all, all the comments I can make are in the same paradigm of looking for non-unitary theories, which are in a sense between unitary theories. So I, I thought about super conformal minimal models and, and WZW models. But I agree, we could look at other physically interesting um, non-unitary CFTs and ask, how severe is the non-unitarity? Is it severe enough that we don't see it or could we hope to see it? So, so one question that has repeatedly occurred on the chat is that, okay, suppose that I take OAN model with AN in a certain range, which can be positive or negative, like N equal 1.5 or N equal negative N. So, like, is there any reason to believe that certain correlators, say for N model with N positive, they, but non integer, they actually would be rigorously amenable to, to this numerical bootstrap treatment? Right. So Kai was telling me recently that in two dimensions, the line of ON models still is known to sit strictly inside the allowed region. And there, indeed, we might be able to explain that fact by taking certain correlators and decomposing them into SL2 blocks. Mm, okay. Are, are you also thinking about higher dimensions? No, 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 I'm not thinking. No, I, I have no, yeah, I have, you know, I, I have uh, this uh, hope that perhaps. Um, that, that perhaps the models with n larger than one are going to be better behaving because because the dimensions so in, in our arguments with uh, with Damon Binder about the non-unitarity in uh, in CFTs uh, there it was important very important to look at um, at analytically dim continued dimensions of of uh, various representations. And so the fact that there were some representations which had negative dimension is kind of crucial uh, feature. But for example, if you look at the OAN model correlation function and, uh, with, and you take N larger than one and suppose that we study the fundamental, the correlation function of the fundamental scalar then the representations that you exchange are, are tensor and anti-symmetric and, and their dimensions and literally continue to n uh, non-integer, they actually remain positive for n larger than one. And so you might think that because of this, um, one could perhaps hope that in this range, there is not the non-unitarity is not so bad and one could try to do just, but what does it mean not so bad? So it would be important to quantify what non so bad, non -so -bad means. Yeah, because even if you have some negative OPE coefficients in these expansions I'm talking about, they might only show up at the, the 10th term or the 20th term or something like this. 
yeah, that's one thing. Another thing, maybe there are going to be no negative coefficients whatsoever because of this. Uh, yeah, so it's so it's interesting. Uh, it would be interesting to, to well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I was wondering if you had anything uh, to add about this. Not really, but I, I agree it's interesting. But then it also depends on the miracle of the constant themselves, right? So in, uh, in this case, you're putting all the miracle of the constant are positive. So the question was that these, these global block coefficients that show up in the decomposition of a virasoil conformal block, they depend on the structure constants of virasoil blocks themselves. And I don't know what you mean by structure constants of virasoil blocks. Well, the, the structure constant is the right minimum model itself, right? So those Indeed. Okay, so these are. Yeah, depending on how you define them. <laughs> These are the coefficients um, that were first found by Dotsenko and Fateyev uh, in the Coulomb gas formalism, if I understand. A exactly. This is a, yeah, I glossed over this, but what I was mostly doing in this talk was taking a virasoil block defined to have one as its first coefficient. Uh, one is positive, and then I'm asking, are the other ones still positive? But one is actually not the leading coefficient because there's there, there's a structure constant of the generalized minimal model that multiplies the whole thing and that is in fact what goes wrong when i say that for generalized minimal models between three and four there's an infinite set of negative coefficients the one belonging to this one comma five here so block in fact, the coefficients from decomposing this one comma five virasoil block are positive, just like the other one. But it's this this structure constant between one three one three and one five that's negative, and that multiplies the whole thing. So then you get infinitely many coefficients which are negative. Um, th does that answer the question? Yeah. So, okay. so this is the Okay, so the question is that in in arbitrary correlation functions in these generalized minimal models, the structure constants that appear are going to be <laughs> positive for some range of central charge and negative for other ranges and and can we say things about when they're negative and when they're positive reliably and i i think we can say that because this paper by dotsenko and fateyev is analytic in m and it provides explicit expressions for these structure constants uh just in terms of gamma functions so we can always go back to those formulas um, in order to know when we expect positivity and when we don't. But but I agree, the this problem of expanding virasoral blocks needs to be considered along with um, along with these structure constants in the literature. Um, yeah, they're very important. Thank you.
Um, okay, so someone has a question? Uh, can I ask him a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, I want to ask you something similar to Sawa's question, but different. Uh, my question is that, uh, is it possible a non unitary theory have a uh, consistent subset which is uh, unitary? So, for example, is it possible uh, for some Wilson Fisher theory, which is uh, non unitary? Yeah, uh, non-unitary, but it's a version of Fisher star, a subset of it become unitary. That's an interesting question. And if you allow trivial examples, I'm tempted to say the answer is yes, because um, at the minimal model values of the central charge and, and conformal weight, we have null states and we have to mod out by the null states before we consider the Verma module to be unitary. But in non-trivial examples, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I, I use the, the language unitary subsector in this paper, but, but that, that's an abuse of terminology. I, I don't actually, I'm, I'm not claiming that these generalized minimal models have a set of operators which closes under fusion and furnishes a unitary theory. Um, having an example of this would be quite interesting. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I guess we can ask a similar question, the reverse question. Is it possible the unitary theory can be embedded into the non-unitary theory? For example, let's say we have a gauge CFT is it possible to find a non-unitary extension of that, including some uh, charged fundamental wrap in it? Yeah, that's an interesting question to think about. Okay, so Sylvain is saying that the, that the icing model is unitary until you add non local objects like connectivities. So I guess that would be an example of this phenomenon. Oh, uh, could, you, could you repeat that? Sorry. Um, should I give the microphone to Sylvain? So, so the comment was that if you also consider connectivity observables in the icing model, so you ask questions like, are are spins belonging, yeah, are, are, are a bunch of spins in some set all up or all down, then this means you don't have just the minimal model anymore. You have non-local observables, and these make the icing model into something non-unitary. Oh, OK. Interesting. Thanks. Right, well, okay, are, are there any other questions? All right, then I guess I'll turn the mic off uh, and we'll call it a day. Someone should stop the recording though.